If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. again to our continuing series we've been doing on this program which is called Christian Answers on early church history. I'm Larry Wessels, director of Christian Answers and I'm in studio today for this series with our I'd like to say master researcher, our director of research for Christian Answers, Steve Morrison. Great to have you here Steve. Thank you Larry. You are one of the, the few individuals in the Christian church I think today in the 21st century that has actually read the Anti-Nicene fathers and the early church father writings read read all the material, done the research, and that hard work that you've done is now being reflected in this video presentation we're doing presently. And I want to thank you again for doing that, okay. since there are so few that have actually done that. And uh, you know, the few that actually have done it usually have uh, kept their research in the scholarly ivory towers in books that sit on bookshelves and theological seminaries and libraries only to be read by a few individuals out there somewhere in the world but it's nice to have a situation where by god's grace we are actually here in a medium where we can get this kind of information distilled put out in an understandable fashion out to the world and as uh, i think walter martin used to say get the hay out of the the, the loft and put it down there on the ground where the cows can get at it. <laughs> and that's basically what we're doing with this kind of uh, ivory tower material that not many people are aware of. And uh, with that said, I'd like to uh, let our viewers know once again that this material is available, the early church father writings, it's available on the internet. Uh, you can contact our ministry through our email or websites, biblequery.org, historycart.com. Uh, uh, call us, write us, whatever, we can give you the information. There's also many Christian uh, publishers that have a lot of this material available that you can purchase. Uh, Christian uh, seminaries have it in their libraries. So you can actually go to the Ivy Tower <laughs> to, get, to, to get this kind of information if you're that dedicated. But anyway, with that said, we're now on show number 11 in this uh, continuing series on early church history and how it affects us here in the 21st century. And as I've mentioned many times before, most of your non-Christian religionists, your atheistic philosophers, your Jehovah's Witnesses, your Mormons, your other groups that are out there, they're going to attack your Christian faith and say, well, the, there's all these Bibles, you can't trust the Bible, and they changed everything up at the Council of Nicaea in 325, so you can't believe what you've got today, and so you might as well just give up Christianity and believe, become a Muslim or become a Mormon, or become a Jehovah's Witness, or whatever it is they want you to become, and just forget this nonsense of what the Bible actually teaches. Well, we're here to say, no, that's not the way you should go about it. Are they telling us the truth about this early church history? I say, no, I think, uh, Steve, you would agree with me on that and say that the early church actually testifies to the validity of the Word of God, the Bible, as does archaeology, as does fulfilled Bible prophecy by the thousands, uh, as does manuscript his history going back. We have a, a numerous apologetic evidences for why we can believe the Word of God, not, not, not least of which is this testimony of the Holy Spirit himself, which indwells all true Christian believers who have been born again by the Spirit. But anyway, with all that said, let us continue now in our series with uh, our researcher, our director of research from Christian Answers. And Steve, just take over the show now and pick up where you've left off, okay. and we'll just continue in this series on okay. early church history. In the previous series, we finished covering uh, the doctrines that the early church taught. 
uh, that had a consensus of four or more Christian writers and none denied. Uh, but they did more than teach doctrine. They also shared their experience and their practices, and we're going to look at, at, at these in the following sessions. So, you know, what did they, uh, ex what did they do? How do they, how do they do evangelism? And anyway, whatever group you're a part of, you might be curious to see where your group matches with what they taught and where it does not. We are evangelical Christians, and our approach is to report the truth and, and let you know the chips fall where they may. Now, the early Christians weren't perfect. But if there was something that no one interpreted in a particular way until modern times, you kind of have to wonder how valid that interpretation is. So let's see what they said about individuals first in the Old Testament and then in the New Testament. Uh, nine early church writers talked that Cain murdered Abel, and there is no indication that they thought this was uh, solely symbolic. Uh, they thought it had meaning for later, but uh, as it does, but they also saw this as a literal thing. Uh, Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice. Uh, seven early church writers uh, referred to that, and specifically Isaac. Um, and Joseph, mention of Joseph were his brothers. Uh, in Genesis 37 to 47, ten writers talked about that. And Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt. Uh, Eleven writers talked about that. And Joshua obeyed God uh, to conquer Canaan. Uh, nine writers talked about that. And there's no indication that they thought it was just made up or just some sort of parable, but that Joshua, you know, really literally did that. Uh, David was godly, at least except for adultery, maybe. Uh, Sixteen writers talked about that. Uh, King Solomon was wise or godly. Uh, Fifteen writers talked about that. Elijah was a godly prophet. Uh, ten early writers talked about him. And mention of Hezekiah and the Assyrian army being miraculously uh, uh, killed, you know, by uh, God's angels. Um, well, not Hezekiah, just the Assyrian army. Just the Assyrian army, right, <laughs> uh, that was besieging Jerusalem under King Hezekiah. Uh, there are six writers talked about that, and that was fairly detailed, but they got pretty detailed in their teaching. And Jonah in the fish doesn't say whale in the Bible or in early church writings, just fish. Uh, and, or Jonah warning the Ninevites uh, was uh, eight writers. Um, and uh, the uh, mention about Samson, there are eight writers for that. So I'll give you some examples. In the letter of Barnabas, which was written either 150 or 150 AD or sometime in between, says that the Son of God was to offer and sacrifice for our sins as the type established in Isaac when he was offered on the altar. So they say that Isaac being offered on the altar was a type of Jesus actually dying for our sins. This is chapter 7, page 141. Justin Martyr, who wrote 135 to 165 AD, mentions Jonah preaching to the city of Nineveh after he had been cast up on the third day from the belly of the great fish. And Justin said this was a sign of Christ. In dialogue with Trypho, uh, chapter 107, page 252. And Jesus also said, just as Jonah was in the belly for three days and three nights, uh, so, the, so the Son of Man will, will be there. Okay. Now, many, many other Old Testament individuals were discussed, but we just showed some just to kind of show how they covered it. Now, uh, today, not all agree with that. Um, and, uh, liberal Christians generally don't believe that a great fish swallowed Jonah. In a public discussion with uh, Muslims and Christians, uh, uh, there was a Sunni Muslim imam, and I presented these points out to people, and they gave him a chance to respond with his views, and he agreed about Cain murdering Abel. Um, this is in, in the Hadith, and I believe uh, alluded to in the Quran also. Abraham offering Isaac as a type of Christ. Okay, he disagreed with this, which uh, now on one hand, uh, the, the Quran does not say who Abraham almost sacrificed. It sort of implies I Ishmael. Now, Muslims today say it was Ishmael, uh, uh, but uh, the Muslim historian Al-Tabari, he gave a long list of early Muslim scholars who believed it was Isaac, and then he gave a larger list of Muslim scholars who believed it was Ishmael. And um, so the Quran actually doesn't say, but Muslims will always not say it's Isaac. Um, and then uh, he agreed with Joseph and his brothers. So a lot of Old Testament stuff and stories are in the Quran and Hadith, and also the historian Al-Tabari too. Moses uh, led the Israelites out of Egypt. He agreed with that. Joshua obeyed to conquer Canaan. He wasn't aware of anything about this in, in the Quran or Hadith. And I have read five of the six collections of the Muslim Hadith, and there's no mention of that in there. Uh, and David was a, a godly, except for adultery. Well, he disagreed with the exception. Because he doesn't believe that David, he said David was a prophet and prophets were sinless, and so he doesn't believe what the Bible said that David committed adultery with Bathsheba. Or murder. Uh, or murder, that's right. Uh, King Solomon was wise. Uh, now, King Solomon in Islamic tradition was a 
kind of a warlike conquering king, but they believe he was wise and could talk to animals and things like that. All right, Elijah was a godly prophet. He agreed with that. Hezekiah and the Assyrian army, he had no mention of this, positive or negative, and Jonah and the fish and more than the Ninevites. He agreed about Jonah, and uh, there was a sir in the Quran about uh, Jonah, you know, uh, called Eunice in, in Islam. Okay, uh, so about New Testament individuals. Uh, Herod's slaughter of the infants in Bethlehem, uh, seven writers referred to this. There was some um, atheists who claimed there was no mention of this outside of Matthew. Well, we have seven uh, early church writers who mentioned this. Now, did they all get this from reading Matthew? They could have, but they could have also got it from the apostles, and they could have got it from other early Christians. So this is like a, a, a second testimony, uh, that not necessarily independent, but not necessarily dependent, um, that testified to this. Okay, John the Baptist was a godly forerunner of Christ. Seventeen writers referred to him. Uh, Judas betrayed Jesus. Eighteen writers uh, referred to that. Pontius Pilate sent us Jesus. Eleven writers referred to him by name. Uh, the high priest Caiaphas, or mention of Herod, tried Jesus. Nine writers mentioned this. And Peter was a godly apostle or martyr. Twenty-four writers mentioned Peter uh, in a positive way like this. And James, the Lord's brother, was godly. Eight writers mentioned this. Uh, there's mention of Mary Magdalene. Uh, five writers mention her, which is about par for a fairly minor character in the Bible. They don't tell us anything besides what the Bible says about Mary Magdalene, though. Uh, Barnabas was a godly brother. Seven writers mention him. Uh, Paul was a godly apostle of Christ. And I have 22 here. I may have undercounted. There may be more, but at least there are 22 uh, that refer to him or refer to his writings as scripture or similar. And there are some more New Testament individuals. Uh, Cornelius the Centurion in Acts 10, uh, that he was saved. Seven writers referred to him. There was Thomas the Apostle. Um, uh, nine writers referred to him. They don't mention him writing any gospel or book or anything like that, though. Uh, Stephen the Martyr in Acts uh, 6, 5 through 7, through chapter 7, 60. Ten writers referred to him. Now, there's a lot of stuff that people have assumed uh, the early church tradition taught. It's not there. It's totally absent. Absent meaning not a single writer referred to this. Uh, for example, devotion or uh, veneration of saints in heaven. Okay, now as we get into this, this is kind of uh, key information, particularly uh, pertaining to the Roman Catholic Church. In this series, we've talked a, some about the Roman Catholic Church, but uh, we've been really dealing a lot with Islam, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, other cults and groups. Uh, but I think this particular section you're about to get into, Steve, is particularly per pertinent to the Roman Catholic Church and their system of uh, uh, traditions that have, they have incorporated into their religion, which in many instances, particularly when you tie in Vatican I and Vatican II councils and the Council of Trent, which they, they have established in their church, you find that a lot of these doctrines we're about to go into are really key and essential to the gospel of the Roman Catholic Church that but leads to not the gospel of Jesus. Exactly. The gospel of the Roman Catholic Church, which is different than the gospel of Jesus, as you said, which we find in the early church writings and the, in the testimony of the New Testament uh, the record that we have. So I want to draw attention to what Steve's about to bring up here because most of this pertains strictly to the traditions that we have uh, in the Roman Catholic religion. So uh, with that said, let's go back to Steve here. We'll run through these, and I want to dialogue just a little bit more before we move on to some other stuff. Go ahead. Okay. So any kind of veneration or devotion to saints in heaven, um, there's nothing about that. All right. Can an excommunicated heretic become a saint after death? This is a key thing to ask Catholics. All right. If Joan, uh, if Joan of Arc... She was burned to death as a heretic. She was tried by an official church council. She appealed to the Pope. The Pope did nothing. And then within 50 years after she was killed by the church as a heretic, um, she became a saint. So if the Catholic Church was right in excommunicating people, did that mean that an excommunicated person is outside the church, they're going to hell, and then 50 years later she goes to heaven? And so she's in hell, or was the excommunication the Catholic Church goofed? And so when they excommunicate somebody, it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to hell. It's like uh, this is kind of a quandary for the medieval Catholic Church. There's no consistency in it. 
And uh, it just shows an error in what happened. But the, the most important thing here is on this particular doctrine, you don't find it in early church writings. No. Before 325 A.D., the Council of Nicaea, which so many cults and religions make a big deal about, we're, we're in early church history before that date. And what we're seeing here from the early church writings is nothing about this stuff. And right. because it is something that's been added by the Roman Catholic Church in this instance about the Joan of Arc situation, it has nothing to do with what the Bible teaches. It has nothing to do with what the early Christian church taught. That's why you can have this contradiction. That's why you can excommunicate the person, say they're going to hell and they're excommunicated from the church, and then 50 years later say, oh, let's make them a saint. Yeah. <laughs> Even though they already declared that they're going to hell. Yeah, yeah. And, and that just shows right there a, 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 a rock-solid example of how false this doctrine, this tradition is, when it doesn't jive with the Word of God or what we find in the early church writings. It's a fabrication that was created later. Go ahead. Okay. So now the early church, they did believe and practice excommunication, and the, the, the Bible indic indicates that in Shining People in 1 Corinthians, but the idea of this flipping flock wasn't there. And likewise, after death, the church can't bestow sainthood. Uh, it's actually God who says if you're going to heaven or not. The idea that saints have stores of merit, and you can pray to a saint and he'll give you some grace out of his stores of merit or something like that, is a medieval Catholic concept, Roman Catholic concept, that is totally absent. Praying through images of saints. Um, this maybe is, is as much Greek Orthodox as, as Roman Catholic. But the early church uh, was very much against images, uh, worshiping images at all. Now, they weren't phobic toward images. I mean, they did have a cross, they did have a fish, and things like that. But the idea of having a, a, a statue in front of you and praying to that statue, or actually, Orthodox wouldn't say they're praying to the statue. They'd say they're praying through the statue. But the idea of praying through the statue uh, is totally absent. Um, From and, the early church writings. Right. And then, and then praying to saints in, in, in heaven, there's no thing about that. And the idea of viewing church relics builds up merit. And this was kind of a thing with the Reformation that, that uh, one of the things Luther was against about how the church needed to make some money so they had these relics and people could see them and they could... And he had the give indulgences. The right, right, right. And, 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 and so if a Catholic or somebody else tells you that you should believe any of these things because it's church tradition, uh, yeah, maybe it was middle-aged church tradition when they were killing uh, people for owning Bibles, but if they tell you this was early church tradition, they're telling you a total lie. Uh, because it is having read every page that I could of the early church writers, there is not a single writer uh, that I have seen that taught any of these things. In fact, when I did a, a, a televised debate, a two-hour debate with uh, Dr. Robert Pastigi, a Roman Catholic scholar uh, from St. Edward's University, uh, I brought up the treasury of the, the church doctrine in the Roman Catholic Church, which has to do with the merits mm -hmm. that you were just bringing up, and how you can use these merits to actually help pay your way out of purgatory to eventually uh, arrive in heaven, uh, which is totally alien to what we find in the scripture, which is always teaching us that not by works, or you say, but it's by grace you're saved, not of works lest any man should boast. And it's, it's the grace and mercy of God through uh, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit granted to us by a merciful God that we're saved. It's not through uh, all these merits and things. In fact, in that debate, I think he even brought up how uh, are you saying that because uh, of uh, Mother Teresa had more merits than she needed to get to heaven, mm -hmm. she, you can take some of her merits and through the treasury of the church and then apply it to someone else who's a little short. They need a few more merits. So I'll take a few from uh, Mary, uh, Mother Teresa and throw it over here to uh, these guys so that they can get in too. You know, and he, he was not adverse to these things because this is actually Roman Catholic doctrine, which has nothing to do with what the Bible teaches or church history. So Yeah, the, the, the idea of like a commercial transaction <laughs> uh, in, 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 uh, or, or, or kind of a timeshare exchange or whatever to get to heaven, you know, it, it is not there. Exactly. Uh, uh, all right, what about Mary, the mother of Jesus? All right, there is nothing in the early church writings uh, prior to Nicaea that said Mary never sinned or Mary did not have original sin. There's nothing whatsoever that says she was co-redeemer or co-mediator. There's nothing that says she suffered for us at Jesus' crucifixions. 
Uh, matter of fact, uh, the Roman Catholic Church has taught that Mary had six other sufferings, including when they, she couldn't find Jesus at the because he was at the temple. They said that was a suffering of her and things like mm -hmm. that. And so she suffered for us through those things. The Roman Catholic Church says that, but someone's telling you a lie if they say the church tradition prior to Nicaea had this. The bodily assumption of Mary into heaven. There's nothing in there either. Mary is the queen of heaven. Now, Jeremiah talks about the term queen of heaven and its idolatrous term uh, for the uh, god, goddess, pagan goddess Ishtar, Ashtar. But in there, fact, that's right, mentioned by, I think, several Old Testament prophets who bring up the queen of heaven. In, in an evil the, sense. Exactly. It's, it's referencing to uh, pagan idolatry. Yeah, so not, not to uh, what the Roman Catholic Church here is incorporated as a title for the Virgin Mary. Yeah, so it's, it's a totally alien and negative evil connotation what we have in the Old Testament. Yeah. Uh, so, so if you want to respect Mary, and we are to respect Mary, um, you, you know, you, you don't want to call her a demon and you don't want to call her after a, 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 a pagan goddess either. Okay? The other thing, Mary's intercession in our conversion. All right? There is nothing whatsoever. No early church where our prior to say had any concept or inkling about this. Mary is heaven's gate. Well, the Bible does teach about the door to heaven, but the door is Jesus. It's not Mary at all. In fact, what we're, what we're finding here in these, these doctrines about Mary, these are Roman Catholic inventions created later in time to incorporate all these man-made inventions to... I, I used to, in some of our shows we did, we did a 16-hour series on Roman Catholicism, and in a couple of those shows I mentioned that Roman Catholicism is sort of like a, a ship that's lumbering through the water over time. From century to century, it's just kind of rolling along. And as it goes along, it's picking up barnacles on the hull. And, you know, and you've got all these add-on man-made inventions that are stuck to the, bar to the hull of the ship. And, you know, if you don't clean those barnacles off over time, what's going to happen to the ship? It sinks. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what's happened to the Roman Catholic Church over time. I was just debating someone on YouTube the other day, and I, they were saying that early church history proves the Roman Catholic traditions and doctrines are true. And, of course, on YouTube, I just made a quick comment. I didn't get into all this, de this detail. Mm -hmm. I just said, look, uh, where, show me where in early church history Vatican II is. I could have gone and said, where's, where's the Council of of, of Trent, mm -hmm. where's Vatican I, uh, things of that nature. What, what, what we're finding here is that the Roman Catholic Church is just a series of barnacles that have been added over time, which have nothing to do with early church history or the Word of God. And that is something that is key to this. We spent a lot of time in earlier shows on Islam and things, but now uh, pay attention to this. What's true dealing with all these other religions has to also be equally applied to something that a lot of people consider to be a Christian church, Roman Catholicism. Why would Roman Catholicism be any more exempt than any of these other religions? Scrutiny of anything else. Exactly. We have to scrutinize everything by the truth of the Word of God, and here we have early church history also testifying against it. Yeah. Go ahead, brother. Yeah. Now, the, the thing that's more subtle about Roman Catholicism, though, is the things we talked about in our previous shows, uh, about the doctrines and things like that, uh, without too many exceptions, uh, the uh, Roman Catholic uh, and the Roman Catholic Church uh, and the Orthodox and Coptic, for that matter, churches and Protestant, they would believe all those things. So it's not like they're taking away as much as like the, you know, your barnacle illustration is good. Is, it is like they're adding on. So, yeah. so, so at least to their credit, they are affirming a lot of essential truths, but then they have all these add-on stuff. And now if they tell you that the essential truths can be proved by early church history, um, that's a true statement, and then they kind of say, well, since then, let's just tack on this barnacle, too. Uh, but, but, but we're basically trying to peel off barnacles, uh, <laughs> you know. But, but anyway, uh, looking at other things, um, Mar Mary has unlimited stories of merit. Again, another modern invention. All right, Vener veneration of, well, middle, middle age invention. Veneration of Mary. Uh, not worship of Mary, but kind of close to it. You know, certainly not calling Mary God, but still, uh, you know, uh, uh, praying to Mary, saying Hail Marys. All right, there is nothing about, there is no Hail Mary prior to Nicaea that we can find. There's nothing about praying to Mary at all. Okay, it's fine for a pope to be devoted to Mary as John Paul II was. No, there's nothing about being devoted to Mary. Uh, visions of Mary, there's nothing about that. Devoted to a specific Mary, well, such as Mary of Guadalupe or, or another. Now, you remember how we talked in the previous sessions about the the, the Christians would um, almost ridicule the pagans and say, well, what if you had three or four Athenas and a sacrifice was made, 
with Athena's comment, argue which was theirs? Well, what if you have three or four Marys and somebody prays to Mary? Well, whose Mary gets the praise? Guadalupe or one of those other Marys? Okay, uh, you don't accept the Mary supporting a heretical book. And Mary of Medjugorje, uh, in what was Yugoslavia, uh, she appeared and suggested they read a, uh, a, a book called The Poem of the Godman. Now, this book is actually on the Catholic list of forbidden books, and because they said it, it claimed it had heretical doctrine, and as a Protestant, we would actually agree with that that it is heretical. But yet, this. Uh, being that's not from the spirit of truth, must be from another spirit, was saying to read that book. Okay? Uh, Mary takes a scapula wear from purgatory. A scapula is like the short thing on the shoulders that uh, cardinals and people wear. If they die and go to purgatory every once a week, Mary goes down and picks people up by the and takes them to heaven. No, there's nothing like that in the Bible. Uh, or the early church writers. Uh, or the early church writers. A rosary bees to Mary. There's nothing about, about, about that in the early church. Uh, someone once said, a Catholic once said, why are Protestants afraid of Mary? And I would say, why are Catholics not afraid to disobey the first and second commandments uh, of the Ten Commandments? Uh, we believe in honoring Mary. I even named my, uh, one of my daughters uh, Mary, and after Mary, the mother of Jesus. Um, so, but we believe in honoring Mary, but we don't think it is honoring Mary of, of venerating her or, or doing things that she wouldn't really want done to herself. Well, what you have here is a classic example of adding to the Word of God. You're adding these barnacles, as we talked about. You're adding things to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when you come up with a doctrine of purgatory, which is not biblical, and you come up with a doctrine with a, having a scapular and Mary's going to take you out of purgatory mm -hmm. and bring you in, you have doctrines of merits and the treasury of the church and all these things which are replacing the actual gospel of Jesus Christ as found in the, in the early church writings as well as the Bible, and you replace the gospel with these types of things, well, what you come up with is a different gospel, mm -hmm. which is a denial of the truth of the Word of God. And that's why this kind of gospel is deadly to a person's soul who would actually replace a worship and prayer to Jesus with Mary, for instance, and, and all these other things. So that's the importance of this. Well, we're down to less than a minute for this show, brother, and uh, so we're going to have to sign off for now. Is okay. there any last quick thing you wanted to say in 10 uh, seconds? Or uh, no, just to say that when someone claims that someone is from the early church, I or somebody else, check it out for yourself. You can read the writings online at www.ccel.org, or you can buy the books, Anna and I Seen the Fathers. And just don't believe everything you hear, but check it out for yourself. Amen. With that, I'm Larry Wessels with Steve Morrison for Christian Answers. Join us again next time in this continuing series on early church history and how it verifies the Word of God, the Bible. May the Lord bless you. We'll see you next time. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. 